Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks so much for joining me. Afraid of the people and struck by the presence and the disposition of Jesus, Pilate tries to wash his hands of Jesus in Matthew chapter 27, which is our passage for today. Verse 24, when Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person you see to it. Now, combining the narratives of the four Gospels, we can construct a more comprehensive account of the basic facts than what Matthew provides here. So, really 12 points I want to hit uh, very quickly before we get into reading uh, a large portion of the chapter. Jesus, number one, was arrested after midnight, so it took a while to assemble the Sanhedrin. In the meantime, Jesus is taken to the house of Annas, the former high priest who really uh, is a really kind of a puppet master. So Jesus then goes to, is taken to Caiaphas, the sitting high priest, which is the son-in-law of Annas. Now Jesus appears then before the full religious council, the Sanhedrin. Jesus then is taken to Pilate, the Roman authority, because the Jewish leaders did not have the authority to actually execute people. So then Pilate finds that Jesus is from Galilee. So in an attempt to sidestep the situation, he sends him to Herod Antipas, who was the governor of that region of Galilee. Herod Antipas was the son of Herod the Great, whose kingdom was divided among his three sons when he died. So there were three sons. Antipas was given the Galilee region, Philip, the Gentile area north of Galilee, and Archelaus was actually given the, the prime area, and that was Judea. However, um, there were so many problems surrounding him that Caesar Augustus took the territory from him and established a Roman governorship, Pilate being the fifth Roman governor uh, there in the area, in Jerusalem and Judea. Herod doesn't want to handle the situation, so he sends him back to Pilate. Pilate tells the Jewish leaders, Jesus is innocent, and says he'll punish Jesus and release him. The priest, they balk at the offer, crowd a crowd builds, and Pilate offers then to release a prisoner, which was customary at the time of the Passover. The crowd, coached by the priest, instead of taking Jesus, demand Barabbas. Pilate tries to wash his hands of Jesus. Jesus is flogged by Pilate, who was hoping that that would satisfy the crowd. It does not. Pilate then a third time tries to persuade the crowd, but they accuse him at that point of being disloyal to Rome. He's fearful and Pilate relents, orders that Jesus be crucified. So let's start at verse 2. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? You see to it. Basically, that's your problem. When, Jesus, or when Judas realized that Jesus had been condemned to die, he was filled with remorse. That was not really his plan. He takes the money back and declares Jesus is innocent, but the religious leaders didn't care. Judas had served their purposes. Verse 5, Then he threw down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. Now, some often ask the question, could Judas have been forgiven and restored to his relationship with Jesus? I mean, Peter denied Jesus three times, and he too was remorseful. He went out and wept. And we'll read later that he was restored to fellowship with Jesus. Judas could have been, but he took his own life instead of persevering. Suicide is the means by which Satan often secures the souls of the lost. Verse 6, but the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, it's not lawful to put them into the treasury because they are the price of blood. You know, what hypocrisy. They kill an innocent man, but they're concerned about putting tainted money into the temple treasury. You know, Jesus' word so accurately described these religious leaders when he said, you blind guides who strain out a gnat and swallow a camel. Verse 13, then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he answered him not one word, so that the governor marveled greatly. Pilate, by the way, was described uh, in history as a, um, an evil, ruthless, and brutal man. 
Yet he saw something in Jesus that caused him to marvel, which explains why he tried to avoid condemning Jesus to death. Verse 15, now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called the Christ? Verse 20, but the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. I mean, think about this for a moment. Barabbas was a notorious criminal, a rebel, and possibly a murderer, uh, an insurrectionist. And here, a guilty man is set free and an innocent man is condemned. You know, we each actually stand in this position of Barabbas. Guilty, but we're set free in Jesus pays the price for our sin. Verse 39, And those who passed by blasphemed, blasphemed him, wagging their heads, this is when Jesus is on the cross, and saying, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priest also mocking with the scribes and elders said, Now come down from the cross, and we will believe you. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Even the robbers who, crucify, who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So listen, to, you know, if you come down the cross, we'd believe you. Why would they have believed him then? I mean, considering all of the miracles that Jesus had done, one more would not have convinced them. And time has revealed the truth to all rather than just a few. Jesus was not just about those people, although he came and he testified, he did the miracles, but they wouldn't believe, they rejected him. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, the message of God's salvation and redemptive has, redemption has gone around the world. And here's something to be cautious about. You know, we keep, you know, if you're saying, well, you know, if God just did this, if God would just do this, I would believe. If God would just do this, I would surrender to him. God has done everything for you. He sent his son to die for your sins and for my sins. And one more act of God is not going to convince you. It is a choice that you must make now. Verse 51, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Now we know very little about this occurrence other than it was a testimony to Jesus conquering death and the grave. Verse 54, so when the centurions and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had happened, they feared greatly, saying, truly, this was the Son of God. You know, hardened Roman soldiers gripped by the reality of what they saw standing at the foot of the cross. The remainder, verses 57 through 66, provide a narrative of the burial in the tomb of Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea and guards there being set at the entrance to ensure that Jesus' disciples did not steal the body. So we'll pick up next time in chapter 28 where we see Jesus overcoming the grave. He conquered the grave. We see the critics and how uh, they were plotting. And then we see the commission that Jesus gave before he ascended back into heaven. Father, thank you for your word. And again, we ask for the Holy Spirit to, to enlighten us, to open our eyes, our understanding, and, and show us how to rightfully apply your word to our lives this day, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, thanks for joining me, and until next time, keep standing on the word.